This is episode 95 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm speaking with Leslie Bauman. Leslie is a sought-after artist and graphic designer whose work has been featured across the United States. She's also the author and illustrator of the children's book, J is for Justify, which features 26 famous horses racing through the alphabet. When she's not in the studio, she's most likely to be found at the barn, spending time with her American saddlebred mare. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I am so excited to have my new friend, Leslie Bauman, on the show with me today. Hi, Leslie. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me on. I am so excited to have you here. Leslie and I actually connected. I mean, we we run in the same circles, right? But this year, we actually connected at the American Horse Publication Conference in Fort Worth, Dallas, and had a blast together. That's where it came up that Leslie... Uh, is an author and has an amazing book and that's why she's on the podcast so (laughs) how I always like to start these off Leslie is to ask the authors how have horses inspired your life so I started off as a horse crazy kid Mm -hmm. and when I was younger I liked to draw the things I was interested in so I started drawing horses pretty young as I got older when I was a teenager and junior high I was on a creative writing team and Still obsessed with horses, I wrote stories about racehorses and entered competitions with them. By the time I was in high school, uh, I was still drawing the horses and people started to hire me to do commissioned portraits of their horses. I went on to study graphic design in college and I knew that horses would eventually find a way back into my work. Now I'm lucky to uh, continue to paint portraits of horses, to write about horses, and I also do graphic design work for people with equestrian-related businesses. And I finally did get a horse of my own after not having one growing up. Um, I still feel like a kid at Christmas every day. I'm so lucky to have her. Oh, it's like a dream story. You know, it's like we all are horse crazy kids and we grow up drawing them and writing about them. But you actually turned this into a career where you started generating money early on commission paintings. Like how did that come into your world? Did you like, were you an entrepreneur at heart from the beginning? You're like, I'm going to figure out how to start a business with my, my art, because this is, you know, a lot of us aspire to that, but to make it a reality is, is a pretty cool story. Yeah. I, I think it luckily just came to me. I wasn't really focused on the business end of it, but people saw what I did with my drawings and they're like, well, can you draw my horse? And it started at the stable where I was riding and working during high school. People started having me do portraits of their show horses. And I even did several portraits for one of my English teachers. (laughs) That's incredible. I mean, talk about keeping everything you were passionate about as a kid in your wheelhouse. I mean, you are doing it. So talk to us a little bit about the, about your business that you now have. I feel really fortunate to have the opportunity to have this studio. I still do the portraits, like I said, and I do graphic design work, helping people that are just starting a business or maybe refreshing their business, um, develop their logos. I help uh, with marketing materials, websites, and I even design publications, including books. Oh my gosh, equestrian authors, take note. So we have a real equestrian graphic designer here on the show. Talk to us about how working in the world of graphic design, having the experience and love you have for horses, creating the portraits of of people's horses for them. How how did that set you up for the writing of of your book, which we're going to talk about here in a second? Like, how, How did those skills help you think about approaching a book project? Yeah, sure. I think without all of those skills, I would have been pretty scared to tackle a project like this. I wouldn't have any clue where to begin. Uh, But in the case of this book, I have always loved to do portraits of horses, but they're usually like my horse or my friend's horses or local client's horses or somebody I've met somehow or another. But these famous horses, I thought, wow, that'd be really cool to 
I wanted to do a portrait of Justify. I'm like, why just Justify if I could do a bunch of these famous horses and a book would be perfect for that. And I think mm-hmm. for my portrait experience, it, it gave me the ability to like look at these collection of thoroughbreds as a whole and see the similarities, but yet to pick out their little quirks and characteristics that made them so individual. Oh, that's so cool. And then your, your medium of choice, what, what, do you, what do you work with? Do you do, do you do portraits in like oil? And then things in in the computer, like how do you choose to work? I do a little bit of all of it. Um, I do work with oils. I do a lot of watercolor and colored pencil work for this book. It was my first big project working digitally and I did it all on my iPad. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about the book. It's it's called J is for Justify, and I happen to know it's an award-winning book too, but it's an alphabet book that you you wrote it, you illustrated it. And you published it yourself, which is really cool. Tell us about JS for Justified and, and where the idea came from and, and show, us, show us the book. Here is the book. It's an alphabet book. It starts, starts from A and works its way through. And there's a portrait and a little story about each of the 26 horses. I had always wanted to make a book. I think they're just wonderful things to touch and handle and to you know, complete a project where you make this thing. It's just such an amazing process but I didn't know what to write about. Mm. And it turned out that as I had grown up and been busy running my business and stuff, I kind of lost track of horse racing. Uh, I used to be pretty passionate about it when I was a teenager, but my son and I watched the Derby together in 2018. And I'm not really good at picking winners, but I picked Justify and he (laughs) won and he kept winning and he won the triple crown. And it was so amazing. I didn't think that we'd see another winner so fast after American Pharaoh. And we had a great time watching it together. And I really wanted to do a painting of him. And then somehow the idea popped into my head. My son was getting ready to start kindergarten. He was learning how to read. I'm like, what about an alphabet book? I wonder if I can find at least one famous racehorse for each letter. Like, I'm not really sure, you know, there's Q and there's some other weird ones, but (laughs) I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and, you know, broke out the Google and did some research and sure enough, yeah, there were easily 26 horses. So it was on. I decided I had to do this thing. That is so cool. So your son inspired it, watching the Derby together inspired it, coming back to your love of racehorsing inspired it. And I can't believe that you found 26 horses to match every letter of the alphabet to make a book. Like I would have thought that that wouldn't have been possible either, but you did it. That's, that's amazing. They're out there. So you had never done a book project before. This is your first like undertaking. Like how, how did you even start to consider the process when, you know, you, you have the graphic design experience, which is a major part of writing or of doing a children's book, but yeah, you know, how did you, how did you educate yourself on the process of doing this? It took a lot of research. Um, I've obviously, I'd done book covers before I'd worked on the insides of books. I'd worked on magazines. So I was comfortable from the design aspect through my work, through my studio. I work with an large amount of different clients and different vendors and stuff. So I'm used to having to go research vendors and their specifications and figure out how things work and dig into a project. So this was kind of the same thing. Had to teach myself a lot, but I wasn't intimidated by it. I wanted to to ask you if there's a message in this book or in this project that you hope people will grasp. Justify Again served as a role model for for the whole theme of it doesn't matter what expectations there are whatever you want to set forth and do it's it's possible if you dig into it Uh, dig in because that it is a any artistic adventure whether it's art or graphic design or writing a book or uh you know even art you know horseback riding is an art you know it's like you have to stick with it and be willing to to learn and fail and keep going. Like that's the biggest thing. Dig in to that thing that's calling you forward. Speaking of digging in, you dug in and you made this thing happen. How did it feel the first time to hold your children's book? I mean, it's beautiful. It's hardcover, the the glossy pages, the the imagery is beautiful. That that must've felt so amazing. It was dreamy. (laughs) It was just an amazing experience that's hard to even put into words. Oh, I'm sure. It's like, I can't believe I actually did this. And and it's, I think you said this too, it's yours, right? You do a lot of work for other people and you know, make other people happy with your your artwork or your creation. And this one was for you and most of all your son, right? 
Yeah, that was great. It was really cool to be able to make something that he was interested in reading and that he'll be interested in some of these stories as he grows older. But most of all, I wanted to show him that if you put your mind to something, you can do whatever you want to. Oh, that's amazing. Like, remember, you know, we are role models for those who look up to us and, and showing them that anything is possible is a pretty awesome skill for them to take into life with them. Now, you, you, I love that you controlled the whole aspect of this project. You did the design, the layout, you wrote it, you d- did the art. Now, how did you go about producing it? Did you go with like an like Instagram Spark or did you go with Amazon KDP? Because this, this is a beautiful book. It's hardback. I, I, a lot of people, a lot of authors I talk to are interested in children's book, but there's like this whole art to it. it, it so let's talk about the production of it, of it first. Sure. Sure. I started off having it printed through Ingram Spark. Mm-hmm. They were the only ones that I could find for a reasonable price that would do a hardcover picture book in landscape format. Since I had these lovely horses that just screamed, they had to be in a landscape rectangle. I totally agree with you. Was a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So I did that for, I want to say most of the first year. And with these images that are full bleed and lots of color. It got tricky to keep the quality consistent. So Mm -hmm. I eventually had an offset print run done. Okay. So then you, this is available on, on Amazon, right? So you work with the the print, the offsite printer, they, they sent you the hard covers and then you work with the, the account where you can sell through Amazon and you provide them with the books. Is that how it's working? I have a pallet of books that came two days before the world shut down with the pandemic. A palette. That sounds like a good a amount. A palette of books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have a distributor that I work with. So I send them boxes of books and they send them to Ingram. They send them to Amazon and all the places. Oh, that's great. So that's another piece of the puzzle that you probably had to figure out how yes, to get this book into the world <laughs> because distribution is a really big piece of the puzzle for, especially for independent authors, right? You don't, you're not working with a traditional publisher who has that built in. So you kind of have to figure out those pieces for yourself sometimes. Uh, It definitely is. And not one that you should overlook in the beginning of the process, because I had no clue when I was starting out. Yeah, right. That's, I I harp on this a lot during the podcast, but it's like, educate yourself, educate yourself, educate yourself, because you you can make a, a quick choice. And sometimes it's hard to get out of a contract or it's not the right fit. And you can, you really kind of have to do your you know, diligence to figure out what, what is the best route for distribution. And and then there's an art to actually writing a children's book. Like, how did you figure that out? How did you take these horses and tell a story around each letter of the alphabet in order to make this thing that vibes and is cohesive and works together? Just did a lot of research about the horses themselves and spent a lot of time reading about them and thinking about what my I think Ben's six-year-old son would think was interesting about these stories. What little tidbits would jump out to a little kid oh. and be memorable? Yeah, that makes sense. And then, well, obviously there was the connection too. Like any any little any little one that watches horse racing with their parent always remembers those moments. So it's like you had that unity too. Like this is a perfect this is a perfect gift. Since a lot of authors that listen to the show would like to write a children's book, talk to us. Since you have both sides going on here like the (laughs) illustration the writing of the book and the design what do you think authors need to know about the components of a children's book in order to make something a success because often a lot of people aren't able to create their own illustrations so they have to work outside with another illustrator uh what would you say to an aspiring children's author after all the things you've learned about this process I would say to bring in an illustrator early on in the project it is such a big component of the story and everything is so integrated. Like your words are going to give the illustrator a lot of ideas and they're going to come up with some cool stuff that you probably never thought of and give you more ideas. And the back and forth is going to result in a wonderful collaboration and a great product in the end. Now, did you draw the pictures first or did you write the little stories that accompanied the, the horse first? I worked on them at the same time. 
Oh, so nice. I got to like talk to myself constantly. <laughs> That's awesome. You're using all sorts of different parts of your brain. You're like, how's this going to fit in landscape? And how does the, what's the quirk that's special about this horse? Let me draw it. No, now I have to write about the horse and start it with a certain letter of the alphabet. I love that. So we have an award-winning author here that did it all herself. So don't say you can't be part of the whole thing. Obviously get help when you need to, but if you educate yourself. This is very possible, especially in today's day and age to get your words out there without having to give up any of your rights, because that was really important to you, wasn't it? To do the whole project yourself. Do you want to talk a little bit about why you chose that route? It was, I wanted control over the whole thing. Obviously I wanted to do the drawings. I wanted to tell the story. And since I'm a designer, I wanted to, you know, design the cover and control how it looked. Uh, timing was also really important to me too, uh, which was a big factor. I, I decided I wanted to do this. I was all in, I wanted to do it now. And I wanted it to come out while Justify was still the reigning Kentucky Derby and Triple Crown champion. Mm -hmm. And I pulled it off by one day. <laughs> Uh, we had the book release party uh, during the Kentucky Oaks the night before the Derby in 2019. And what a great idea to have a release party the night before it happens. And then you also, it's available in the Keeneland bookstore. Is that right? It is uh, in their gift shop. In their gift shop. How did you make that happen? Did your distributor do that? Or did you march in and say, I've got this book that you guys need to carry? <laughs> I marched in. <laughs> I love it. That was the track where I saw my first uh, big race in person and they were one of the first places to carry the book. So that was really a special moment for me too. Oh, that's so cool. And that's really great out of the box thinking, right? You know, where, where is your target audience? Yeah, it can be in bookstores all over the nation, all over the world, but like, where's your target demographic? It's right there where horse people go and right there at the track. So that's an excellent. Absolutely. Place. And good on you for marching in and and making that making that happen because I'm sure you you see a lot of book sales out of it being available there. Yeah, definitely. How did you get this book written? Because you run a business, you're a mom, uh, you have you've got a lot going on, and you're taking care of other clients, you're doing portraits. Did you structure a day in a certain way to get the words on the page or and the illustrations done? I did. I was lucky when I was working on the book. Uh, I had a couple of large design contract jobs that were winding down and I had a, a chunk of time that I could devote to this. And I'd send my son off to the bus stop and he'd go off to school. And I'd spend a couple hours in the morning working on the writing on the stories and everything. Uh, I'd take a break in the middle of the day because of course I have to go ride and exercise my horse <laughs> and then come back and spend the afternoon working on the illustrations. And then often after he went to bed, I did a little bit more work on whichever part the illustrations or the stories that I kind of felt like I was in the middle of and didn't want to stop for the day. And that's how I got this book done. And since I was working on the iPad, I could take it along and work in some other places, you know, like at the bus stop waiting for them or here and there, which was really cool. That's awesome. That sounds like a perfect schedule, you know, put, take care, be with your kid, put him on the bus. And then you've got the morning to do your thing. Then you are able to be with your horse. Then you can do more work in the evening. I mean, that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur and an author, right? You can, you can fit these things in. Now you design this whole thing on an iPad. Is there a particular program that you work in? I imagine being a graphic designer yourself, you're probably working in a pretty high tech iPad program, but talk to us a little bit about how that works. Like how you send yourself the file. Like, I don't even know how to wrap my head around what, what that would be. <laughs> yeah. I spend a lot of time working with Adobe apps. Uh, I work with Adobe Fresco on the iPad for things like this mainly. And it's really cool because you can just save your files to the cloud and, you know, come over here to the computer and open it right up in Photoshop or just, you know, drag it into InDesign to lay out the book. That is it's so amazing. seamless. It's amazing. <laughs> and I imagine having an education, how to use all those applications is probably makes it a lot easier. You know, it's like, if I was to even try that on, I wouldn't know. So yeah, I don't even have to think about it. Like my fingers know the shortcuts and that's, I, I can't believe how much technology has changed the way things work. <laughs> I think I, I had uh, Jean Abernathy who does uh, Fergus, Fergus the horse oh, yeah. on, on the show. And she talked about how back in the day she would have to pencil sketch and then fax things over to get approval and then hand color everything, you know? So it's like times have changed so much when I, it comes to graphic design. I can't even imagine. And one of the really cool things is it's easy to make changes this way too. Ah, so is there like, do you have a you, little pin you work on the screen and then you can just 
go like that and re- redo something. <laughs> yeah, you can undo, you can use the little eraser. It's awesome. Oh, that is so cool. So it's like literally the iPad replaces the pen and the paper and it just yeah. makes steps easier and you can layer over the colors and, and do all that. I want to come and like sit with you and watch you create like something on an iPad. I think that would be an amazing experience. It was actually really cool too that I was able to kind of like make a template because the horses and the book they're in five different poses. Mm-hmm. If you flip through it, you'll notice. So it was easy to just go through and colorize each one of them and maybe, you know, braid some of their manes where they needed and change the letters. So I wasn't starting from scratch each time. Right. You, like you said, you studied their quirks. So you, you had like kind of the model and then you could go in right. and adjust things as needed to fit how the horse actually was in real life. Y- you mentioned uh, you're, you, know, you work with a the distributor. They're helping you get the books in the places. You marched into the Keeneland gift shop and you said, please carry my book. And they did. And you mentioned you had a uh, launch party for the book right before the Derby. What other ways are you reaching your readers and getting the message out about your book? Because it, the interesting thing I would imagine about having written a children's book is that your your audience isn't actually the child. Either the book will be read to or will be reading the book. So how are you reaching the people that will buy this book for the person who will end up reading it? I do a lot of other events, uh, book festivals. I'll take the books around to uh, horse shows and things like that. And I find that it's often the grandparents who buy mm-hmm. the book. And a lot of times it's kind of an excuse that they have a grandkid that might want to read it. They, they really like horses and racing too. <laughs> yeah. It, I was just talking with somebody before and it's like, it's almost like we're, we're buying horse lovers are buying this book and hoping that the next generation will come into the horse love with us. Right. Sort of thing. It's kind of a cool thing how we get to share that across generations. Absolutely. And I love that you have a son. The world needs more cowboys. So I hope, I hope you're <laughs> teaching them how to ride horses, but I am good. That's also an interesting point though, because it's grandparents, it's particularly for your book, because it's so beautiful. Like doing live events is a really smart thing in-person events now that we can start doing them again. But are you, are you able to reach them through social media or are you having more success? Are you having more success online or more success in person when it comes to reaching the right people to buy the book for, for the little ones? Probably in person, I would say. I think that it could go either way. It's just a matter of where I put my efforts. Right. Yes. And we only have so much time in, uh, you know, yeah. in our day, <laughs> especially when we're we're busy doing all these other things. I mean, you have the business. You have you're writing you're writing books. You have you're taking care of clients. You have a kid. You have you have a child. You have horses. I mean, all of that is very time consuming. And you have a spouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I we, we always forget about the spouses <laughs> right yes <laughs> busy women uh, so how, how do you how do you make time for for everything that you're doing like you know now especially now like as things have shifted in the world like you don't you don't have that opportunity as much I would say to to make room in your day when you when you walk into the bus and then you come and sit have you had to make adjustments right I have had to make adjustments when the pandemic hit and the, you know, there were only a few weeks of school left and we finished that year up, but we decided to homeschool our son for the Mm -hmm. next year. Didn't know how it would go, but we figured it'd be better than him sitting in front of a computer being frustrated. And it turned out that it worked out really well for all of us. And it worked so well that we decided to do it again. Oh, good for you. So it's been a lot of fun, but I don't have those quiet windows anymore. So I'm kind of struggling to come up with a way of dealing with managing time, but I try to take advantage of the the opportunities with the extra time I have with my son. Uh, We spend time at the barn together. He's really getting into reading on his own now, and I'm paying a lot of attention to what he's into and how it might inspire what I work on next. I know, exactly. So I was, that's exactly where I was going. Like, what are you curious mm-hmm. about? Where do you think you're going to go with this? So is there another book that, that you think is in you? Oh, yeah. I could easily do a lot more stuff with racehorses, especially some famous rivals from 1989, the year I got into it. I also, I have a saddlebred. I've ridden saddlebred since I was a kid. So they're very much a part of my life and I could see them working into a project. I've got some ideas for that. These days, Alex is really into graphic novels. Could be something cool. And he's also into field guides to animals. So look out for some kind of combination of some groups of those themes. 
Well, what I'm hearing is there's a plethora of ideas. It's just like which one to capture in the butterfly knot next, yeah, right? Yeah. There's so much possibility. Right. I mean, you're so talented. You can write, you can do the artwork, you can do the design. Uh, so that, that saves a lot of time being able to wrap your head around all those things. And a graphic novel, how fun would that be? Yeah. And you're a you're lot of drawing. <laughs> oh, a lot, a lot of, drawing of drawing on your iPad, right? <laughs> Uh, the, and then saddlebreds. It's so interesting. I love hearing how people wind up with the breeds that they choose. You know, I, I think a lot of the times it happens just because of like who your horse, first horse trainer is or where you first take yes. riding lessons. Yes. Was yep. that the case for you with with getting into the love of saddlebreds? It was indeed. Um, I was pretty obsessed with Arabians when I was a kid, but when I started riding, the lesson barn that I went to had American saddlebreds, and yeah, I fell in love. It didn't take much time at all. Yeah. And it's sort of kind of like what you grow up knowing. Like I started off with the quarter horses and doing 4-H and stuff like that. So, you know, so it's it's just sort of, it's sort of like where you start is usually kind of what you wind up in. What is your seat of choice? Do you, are you in in saddle seat, English? Saddle seat. Yep. Saddle seat. So you were the the top hat. Have you been like a showgirl? Did you show your horse or? I did. Yeah. I have a little derby. Nice. Little derby in the the long coat. <laughs> Clearly, getting all the terminology wrong. See, like this is the thing to also keep in mind for other authors. It's like when you're in one discipline, if you scoot over to a different breed, they say things differently. They do. Everything and, is completely different. Yeah, like, so it's so weird. You think it was just horses and horses, but it's it's not. It, I know that's the most interesting thing about like horses like so, you know you're writing about the racing industry and thoroughbreds they have their own terminology I'm talking here about quarter horses and I'm asking you about things about celebreds and I'm saying everything wrong <laughs> you know about the the derby I called it a top hat you know so it's yeah it's I even put a glossary in the back of the horse racing book because oh, it's, that's brilliant. it's confusing yeah no it is and then you know that's that's the funny thing like that's a great point and it just kind of came up organically here in this conversation but when you're writing about different disciplines of horses even if you think you know horses get with someone that knows that breed to look over your work yeah yeah, and help you make sure you got the terminology right because those people will be like oh it's not right and then you'll be like "Ah, I didn't mean to offend the equestrians you know but it's really interesting so if I was to start writing about saddlebreds and intertwining them in my stories I would have to work with you to be a beta reader so I make yeah, sure I get give me a call analogy, right <laughs> that would be awesome <laughs> you're an entrepreneur you have your own business you took on the book project you do portraits for people you're doing a lot of different stuff what has been the best part of this creative career that you've developed for yourself beyond the fact that this is what you wanted to do when you were little and you're doing it today as an adult <laughs> I like the freedom to do all these things and maybe just all the things I like that I didn't have to decide. I didn't have to say, Oh, I'm, I'm going to do graphic design for, you know, such and such type of client. And that's all I'm going to do. Like, mm-hmm. I can do all the things. And then what has been the most difficult thing of this whole entrepreneurial journey for you? I guess I'm always wondering, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> mm. And it's just taking a long time to realize that there's no right answer. And that's a great answer, right? It's like, all you do is you pursue one thing, tack on what you need to keep looking, making it work. I always like to talk about having your own business or or doing these projects as like a giant piece of gum that you keep sticking more pieces. Of <laughs> I <gum> love that. <laughs> it's like, oh, and then, but then you get to like this spot where things are really working. You're like, wow, that's a big gum wad. I don't know how I did all that, but it's like (laughs) one thing at a time. And then it all adds up to a success, like having that book in your hands, you know, it's like when you you started, you had no idea. Right. 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 And you can't just look at it all and get overwhelmed. You you just kind of have to keep moving along, move forward. Yeah. Best advice ever. Just one baby step at a time. And then all of a sudden you've got a finished product. And there's people that help along the way too. I mean, did you, did you reach out to any fellow children's book authors as you're going along on this journey? Or did you research what other people were doing in the genre uh, before you published this? Yeah, I did a lot of research on what other people were doing. Mm -hmm. So how many hours did you spend in like the local Barnes and Noble children's section looking through picture books? (laughs) A lot. (laughs) More more than my kid. (laughs) That's awesome. And then how many books did you end up buying for him in the process? Probably a bunch of those as well. A lot, a lot. But that's I, awesome. I finally gave up making the excuses. It's like, no, I'm, I'm buying this kid's book for me. 
yeah. I have a collection now and I just keep adding to it. <laughs> Wait, what's so great is you have a test market right there in your own, own home. You know, you could be it like, it's wonderful. Yeah. You can test your product right there at home and, and see where the interest lies. So that's really cool. Yep. What advice would you give to someone? Because you're clearly achieving your dreams and you're doing what you always set out there to do. Like what advice would you give someone who like has a big dream uh, and wants to achieve it? Like, is it, if it's writing a book or getting on a horse for the first time or climbing that mountain? What, what would you, what would you say to someone who's just getting ready to get off the ground with going after a dream? I would say to go for it. Don't make up excuses to hold back. Just dig in. You'll learn along the way. People will help you along the way. You'll make a lot of good friends along the way and have a lot of fun doing it. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, this is an example of that. We met each other at the American Horse Publications Conference. And now we're like going to be lifelong friends. And we also write books and we can help support each other and take care of each other. I I always think uniting and working together is way better than trying to tackle anything on your own. It is so much better. Mm-hmm. You know, is there anything a, a reader of your books or a client of your business would be curious to learn about you? When I was finishing up the book and I wanted to give a name to the horse related portion of my business, I came up with the name Elizarin Chestnut uh, based off of the paint color Elizarin Red, which I use a lot when I draw chestnut horses. And my horse at the time, my saddlebred Clever, um, he was a beautiful chestnut. So that's where the name came from. And a week before the book came out, I lost him. Uh, it was a Saturday morning and he colicked. And we sent him off to Ohio State University for surgery. And there was nothing he could do. And it pretty much destroyed my world. Yeah, I um, can only imagine. We were both born on the 19th of May. Uh, we were both born with 19 letters in our names. Uh, He was born on my 21st birthday and I lost him right before his 21st birthday. So I had kind of had to really take my own advice and keep pushing forward. It was hard. Yeah. I I just, I thank you for sharing that story. I mean, that's a very emotional story, particularly for people who love horses. And I expected him to be around another 10 years. And so it was, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, horses can live to be 35. And that's what we all hope for is that, that we get them over, over that line. But I, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss, but I think that really resonates. That story really resonates with the whole theme of what you've been talking about. It's like life is hard and, you know, we it is hard things that are so important to us, but keep digging in and you keep saying digging in and it must've really taken something for you to move forward a week before the book came out with with all that going on in your life that's a lesson learned right like and and the beautiful thing about that too is you were pursuing a passion project that gave you maybe something else to focus on was was that helpful yes. for you yes yeah if this was some project I wasn't so passionate about it would have been awful trying to finish it quite honestly right yeah like it's important know. to do what you love yeah great great point so I don't, I don't even, you know, like when I read that, I was like, Oh, cause it was one of the last <laughs> questions I sent over to you. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't, can't believe it. I mean, that, I think that's something we all dread, but I, I love that the message was to push through, take your own advice, believe it, believe in yourself. And now you have, you have another saddle bread, right? I do. I have a slightly younger, uh, liver chestnut mayor. She's my first mayor and very much a mayor. <laughs> I was going to ask you, how did you, <laughs> usually people are gelding people or mayor people. I happen to be a mayor person, so I understand I have two mayors, but what made you choose to go from a gelding to a mayor? Usually, usually people don't do that. Yeah, I guess I wasn't like set on having one or the other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she was younger, she was a mayor, she was kind of, she was different Mm because she wasn't going to replace him. She was Mm going to be unique. Yeah, we've had our challenges and we've worked really hard this year and it's such a rewarding thing to have gone through some of those things. And I I love her. She's really cool. Heart horses or any horse, right, that's come into your life, they all have such a unique, different personality and there's always growth from what you learn from each one and what's her name and what are your, what are your dreams of accomplishing with her? Her name is Gypsy. Originally, I just wanted another horse that I could ride around the barn Mm because Clever had been retired for a few years. And Mm -hmm. that was a, you know, that was a fun speed for me at that time in my life, but we're working really hard and I'm hoping to get in the show ring with her next year. Oh, that's so exciting. I, I guarantee you 
I mean, A, that's something to work towards and that's you digging in again, you know, because like, I understand what it's like to have a retired horse. So it's like you, you slow down a little bit and then, yeah. you know, when you've got a younger one, it's like, okay, I can do things again. So what am I going to do? But I imagine that that's going to inspire pieces of that, that saddlebred book that you're, you, that's been rolling around yeah. in the back of your mind, just getting in that yeah. show, that show environment. Yeah, for sure. Well, Leslie, I have so enjoyed speaking with you. I loved getting to know you at AHP. I know we're going to continue our friendship and I'd love to have you back on with the next book. But in the meantime, you know, if there's authors listening to the show that are looking for help with book design or need a logo created, start off by telling us where people can get more information about your business and then where can they get your book? Uh, you can get more information about my business at elizarinchestnut.com. And the book is available at the Keeneland gift shop, as well as Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble's website, all your online retailers. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes. And make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.